it's all good. Um, but like I said, your LinkedIn page is professional and it makes mine look like I've been online for like five minutes. Just I, because mine is doing something doesn't mean that yours is not doing something. Um, um, well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Your about section is incredible. So welcome to Lessons from Learning Leaders. I'm Dwayne Lesseter and joining me today, Cassie Labore. And is, did I say that right? I want to make sure I did. Labore. Well, like I think it was nice the way you said it. I usually just go with labori, but I, I think Labori's. you made it sound nicer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Cassie, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I remember I was looking at, I was, I was going through the um, training magazine conference and expo listing and I was like, okay, these folks, they know what they're talking about. They'd be great to have on the podcast. And I looked at, at yours and I was like, Cassie, how do I know this? <laughs> Virtual training hero. How do I know? And then it dawned on me. I sat through your section. I sat through your training at an ATD conference not long ago. Uh, I kind of want to think it was in like New Orleans or something. Um, was it in New Orleans? I have been there a number of times. And so it's so highly likely. It was either I a think core it was, four or a, um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. It was a core four. And I remember being there. It was right after Sardi Gloves book latest book just launched so i don't know that it was that long ago um but yeah i thought I, this would be one that uh, this would be an episode that a lot of people could get out of or get a lot out of because so many people struggle making online learnings fun making them at least even interesting <laughs> where you don't have join i don't know how many times um just between you and me and no one else i don't know how many times i've been on an online learning and half of my screen has the, the the chat open, the video open with my camera off. And the other side has the video game that I've been trying to play for a long time. And because I, that's allowed, I'll, I'll just play my video game. And at the end, I'll click, you know, leave meeting. And I've now got credit for that. So before we get into how to transform blah into aha moments for your virtual learners, tell me about yourself because your about section is amazing. Ah, well, thank you so much. Goodness. Uh, that's not something that I just wrote one day. It's certainly been something <laughs> that has uh, maybe, you know, grown over the years as I've added and perhaps looked at other people's profiles and said, oh, I should maybe do something like that. <laughs> but thank you for noticing that. That's so cool. Uh, uh, way back in the late 90s, I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. And I was, you know, fresh out of college and I wanted to be a trainer. I had earned a degree in public speaking and in uh, theater and performance. And uh, there was a job fair one day and I thought, how would I get a job with that kind of background? And that's how I landed in learning and development. I got my first job as a trainer teaching Microsoft applications. And uh, that ultimately led to me working for WebEx as a product trainer. And that's what was my introduction into how to do virtual training uh, because I was working for the software that was, you know, allowing people to meet online uh, long before anyone cared about meeting online. And uh, certainly could have never predicted what happened in the year 2020. And, you know, there were other things that happened too that. Uh, drew people's attention to working online. Uh, but 2020 was the major one where now everyone works online or lives online and does all sorts of things online, whether they want to or not. And that certainly brought a whole lot of attention to the work that I was doing. Um, I like and enjoy very much helping people to be successful in the work that they're doing. And uh, with the background that I gained, the experiences that I learned and how to teach people how to use Microsoft apps, I, I just got very good at saying, well, this is how the tech works. Now let's talk about why and, and how and what we can do with it. And I bring that same kind of energy to teaching people how to you know, train online, which is where my primary business is, though the business continues to grow and is leaning more into, well, in addition, leaning into working remotely in general and learning to use technologies to not only do training, but to live our lives. How do we maintain human connection, which actually was what I was always teaching when I was teaching trainers and designers to do this online stuff. Uh, really, at the heart of it, we were looking at 
human connection and engagement and, you know, making meaning out of these technologies that were allowing the connection. But the tech doesn't create that. It enables that. I always like to okay. say that uh, tech is cool. People are cooler. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, I want to get into how to make connections in a virtual setting, because that, for some people, that might be just a complete paradigm shift for them. That, that, that's even possible. You can do that. And it, I want to talk about that. But first, you said something that I find compelling. You you were in the San Francisco Bay Area when? It would have been, well, I always say that culturally I'm from California, though I now reside in upstate New York, or I should say Western New York, Rochester. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I always say culturally I'm from California, though. It would have been in the, uh, like all through the 90s and early 2000s. So I, was, uh, I was at Alameda Naval Air Station. I lived in Alameda. So we probably passed each other um, while, while, because I was there from 92 to 95. Oh, my gosh. On the USS Abraham Lincoln. You know what? Because you know what? Uh, I have uh, one of my previous relationships, Navy, stationed at Treasure Island, which is what took us to that area. We ended up living in Alameda because a lot of people in the Navy do live there. I love Alameda so much. <laughs> Treasure Island holds a special place in my heart because that's where I got out of the Navy. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's where but, he uh, began, and he was on. A, he got assigned to a tugboat for his first assignment. Who gets that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, technically, you're on the ship. So, yeah. but I remember driving. I, I lived in San Jose with my brother. He he lived in San Jose, and I'd commute up yeah. to Alameda. This has nothing to do with training. I just nothing. think this is a Although neat it's connection. The origins here. of my training life, and then I went to San Francisco State after going to the College of Alameda. So you, nice. you get all this. <laughs> I remember I remember that area well, and I miss uh, being out in Alameda. I, I remember standing on one, you know, on the shore and looking across and seeing the San Francisco skyline and going out under the Golden Gate Bridge. Great memories for me in that area. So that's and a that nice connection. And area, too, is Star Wars. That's where Lucas decided to make the uh, AT-ATs. That's what they are. Really? It was inspired by all of that equipment there in the Naval yeah. Station, right? And now I watch Mythbusters, and they record Mythbusters on Alameda Naval Air Station. So every once in a while, I'll be like, I've been there. I know where that exactly where that's at. So, you know what? I think nice I had a job for a minute at the credit union at that Naval Station. I think I've been I to that. So yeah. small, small <laughs> world. How cool is that? Yeah, that is um, so cool. Wow. So the idea of taking virtual learning and creating meaningful moments how do you how do you do that how how do you take something as almost sterile and cold as an online learning and turn that into something meaningful where you can have meaningful connections well see the thing is it's not the content that i'm doing that to and i think what you're talking about there is is sort of the content or the process right maybe it but if you think about like it's it's actually just it's the people and the people that are doing the work and what are their needs and what's driving them. And so for me, it's all about that human connection. And I, I think what happened, what I've actually seen happen over all the years was this turning away from, oh, icebreakers, they're lame, you know, or um, anything that would be perceived as, quote, fun wasn't applicable to what we needed to do, you know, to do the job. And I think that was a mistake. Uh, and, and, and not that I'm saying we should have icebreakers only be for fun. They need to be relevant and worth it. But we need to go back to the idea, you know, it's kind of like the first thing you learn when you're learning training uh, is about safe environments. And, and how do we make people feel um, heard, seen, like they belong, that they matter? You know, those are the things that we need to do first. And then we can get to, oh, yeah, and then you've got to manage this system or, you know, understand and be able to implement this process. But, but people usually can't get to that piece unless they're feeling comfortable enough. And that comfort could be defined in so many ways. You know, for some people, it might be that everything's very clear and everything's working properly. And then they're comfortable. Where other people mean that they need you to just recognize that they're having a hard day, you know. And and I think for for me, what I do, no matter what the topic may be, 
as for me, it is you first. How are you? What's happening? I'm here to help you figure out and make sense or whatever this thing is. And sometimes that's going to be hard and sometimes it's going to be easy and we're going to figure it out together. And what we're going to also do is make sure that the technology doesn't get in the way of uh, the work that we need to do, ultimately the life that we want to live. So I grew up in training at the feet of Bob Pike. I mean, I've been doing training for, I was thinking about this the other day. I was doing training in the Navy. I remember sitting there thinking, okay, well, I know how to do this. And I really enjoy teaching others how to do this. But it was, I really, when I met Bob, I started learning so much. And while you were talking, it reminded me of something that he used to say, and that it is not about you, that you need to make sure that you're not walking into that room with the intent of making everybody in that room so impressed with you. Your job is to make them feel impressed with themselves. And it sounds like that's what you're saying. It is. Yeah. And I mean, I have a responsibility to know what I'm doing and to be able to guide people, but they're not, they're not there for me. I'm not like super famous, you know, yet. <laughs> right. So it's a mistake to think that they came for me. They came for them. And it's my job to discover how to make those lights happen for them in a way that makes sense. You know, I always think when I'm teaching something too, that like, I already know it. So it's not about me proving to you that I know it. It's about me getting to know you so I can figure out what it is that you need so I can help you get it in the way that you're going to get it. Because, you know, you're probably going to understand it differently anyway, and you'll probably do it differently. And I, I look at it as I'm here to offer and guide. But my main job is to figure out the audience. Well, how do you do that? How, let's talk about how you, how you do that when you, you're dealing with, and let's just say we're not dealing with some kind of seminar where there's 500 people in this, right? right? Maybe you've got a training room of, of 20. How do, you, how do you go about making them feel important and making them feel like it's about them? I mean, I open with questions immediately and uh, opportunities for them to contribute right away. You know, so, so for me, it isn't about, hi, I'm Cassie and here's what I'm, I've planned for you today. <laughs> you know, it's, hi everybody, what's up? Where are you? What's happening? Why are you here? How can we make this work for you? Here's what the outline is. Does that make sense? Is that what everyone signed up for? You know, I like to throw in a lot of humor. I use a lot of my own personal anecdotes to make it safe enough. But I'm asking questions right in the beginning. Like I teach people how to be virtual trainers. I certify them to do that. And I've been doing that for 25 years at this point. So I know how to do it. You know, it's fine. I know how to do it. But what I don't know is how you do it or what you need. And so I'm going to ask people as soon as they come in, uh, what does engaging training look like to you? What does it act like, sound like, feel like to you? Because I actually already know that you're here to learn how to engage when you teach online. If I ask, what do you want to learn today? They'll be like, I want to learn to be engaging. <laughs> so I already know they want that. I want that too. And so and instead, what I decide to do is just bypass that A, B, C, or D, or yes or no question and ask the deeper question. Because when I say, what does it look like, act like, feel like, sound like, I'm going to get different answers from each of those people. Some are going to be similar, but they're going to be you. And then I get to use that. And so then when I'm like, look at the agenda that we've planned, when you mentioned that it sounds like somebody asking lots of questions that you actually want to answer, look, we have a whole segment on questions and strategy and formatting and difficulties and how we debrief those. So I'm super excited. When we get there, I'm going to be calling on you, Dwayne. You said that was your, your main thing, you know? You know, so I'm able then, and I'm, and I'm so connected to the content, so I've prepared it and I do know it. And let's let's not pretend that I don't get nervous. I mean, certainly I'm human and all those things happen, but I want to know what you need. And then I'm like making notes. I have all kinds of like, I always have like notebooks and things next to me and I'm taking notes and making like when, if, if you were to have said questions are what engages me, I'd be like, Dwayne, questions. And so then when I get to that part, because I have prepared my training and my materials, I'm going to look down and be like, Dwayne, we're at that part that I know you've been waiting for. And that's then personalizing it, using your name, you're part of it. You feel like we're building a relationship because I paid attention to what you're interested in. Um, 
you know, and then we're making it, I personally like to also make it, you know, a little bit of fun. That's looking really there was, trying to get through the day, <laughs> right? There was something a colleague of mine named Megan used to do. And I did so many virtual trainings with Megan and it didn't dawn on me what she was doing until we <clears throat> had done the, like maybe five, 10 trainings together. And I was like, why is this so important to her that she does this? And then it hit me what she was doing and what she would do is as people joined. So if you joined, she'd be like, hi, Cassie, how are you? Hey, if you don't mind, go ahead and put where you're at, the, the town and the state right there in your name. And then as soon as you did that, it was, well, where are you? And tell me about Rochester. What's that like? What, do you, what yeah. how, have you lived in New York? And she was making every person yep. who came in that room feel like it, they were very important. Yep. And once I figured out what she was doing, I was like, she's amazing. At this this is fantastic. The people, the people are the secret. Like that's, that's also one of my latest favorite questions. When people join, it's pretty common to type in the chat where you are located. And then what do you say? Great, Rochester, that's awesome. I've never been there. Or I heard about garbage plates. You know, you have to make it up. The trainer then has to become the person. And a better question is, what do you love about where you are located? And then people that's are like, I'm question. in Rochester. I love that it snows all the time. Not true. <laughs> Not true, she says. Is it, snow, is it snowing there now? I see snow going through the Midwest. We just had it here. Yeah, it was here. Yeah. Although it's now turned to rain. We're fine. We're good. I live in a snow. I love, <laughs> I love, uh, I, I've been teaching uh, our staff where, it, where I work that the most open question you can ask, and I learned this from Monica Guzman, whose, whose book, I never thought of it that way, is fantastic. It's a great book on how to have uh, com crucial conversations in contentious times without starting a fight. And she, I think it was her anyway. I've read a lot of books recently, sorry. But she's, <laughs> what I remember was the most open question you can ask isn't even a question. It starts with, tell me. Yeah. So just say, tell me about Rochester. I've never been there. And yeah. then sit back and watch what you learn. And at the same time, you're making that person feel important. And you're learning more about them so you can use that uh, later on to make them feel more and more important about it's themselves. True. And the pushback that people will give you about teaching online specifically is, I don't have time. I've invited hundreds of people and I only have an hour. And so then I'm going to say, all right, let's take a look at uh, what your goals are then. You know, and what can you accomplish if you've got hundreds of people in an hour? You know, there are different approaches. We're, we're talking about inspiration. We're talking about um, storytelling that inspires people to change the way that they're thinking. You know, teaching somebody how to use a complex database in an hour with hundreds of people is an unrealistic goal to achieve. So there's that. And then if you are, even if you have 20, though, time is always, you know, it, it moves faster when we're in an online training, I think. <laughs> it goes slower when it's boring, but it goes fast when it's working. And so... Uh, the, the timing thing is managed through letting people use the different features in creative ways. And so I might have everyone chat that answer. What do you love about where you're located? But I'm not going to call on every single person in a group of 20 to then talk about that. Neither does anyone want me to because they've already chatted it. And so it's respectful to call on maybe two people and then also respectfully ask one minute. You got to tell us more, Dwayne. Would you mind coming nope. off mute? And then you do two. And then you call on two, two or three different people later for another thing. And you use annotation and polling and breakouts and all the features to gather all this information all the time about where they're at, how they're responding, what they're working with, and how they're challenged by each of those things, whatever it may be. And you're managing the time by not being like, next person, next person, next person. <laughs> you know, I used to call it in online training, we have the advantage of concurrent collaboration all at once. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be one person at a time. And if you're doing that one person at a time thing, it probably isn't engaging. So it sounds like when you do this right out of the gate, you're creating a sense of belonging. And with that, I would think a, a sense of safety, but how else do you go about creating that sense of safety in an online setting? There are a lot of times people 
won't participate or won't engage because they just don't feel safe. So what are some tips that you can give some folks on creating that, that safe environment for participation? I think the first thing that has to happen is what you mentioned about what, you know, we learned from Bob Pike many years ago is that it's never about me. And so I'm always looking at all the different things that are happening. And so in any design that I've put together, there's lots of different opportunities for you to participate and in different ways. And I'm going to set the bar high and I'm going to model that and continue to encourage you all along the way. I always work with a producer so that I've got a little help watching what's happening. And so for highly like involved skills-based training that I might be delivering, facilitating, I'm, I've got an eye on all the things that are happening. And so I know when someone's not participating. And then I know that I've got the next activity designed in a different way. You know, so maybe being on webcam and talking didn't work for that one person that I noticed isn't here right now. But in the next one, we're going to do a private two-person chat timed for three minutes and nobody will be on camera and nobody will be talking for three minutes. Did they do that? And if they didn't do that, you know, I'm noting what's happening. So not only am I teaching and having designed the whole thing and delivering the whole thing, but I'm also noting how people are responding to it. And if they're not, I'm going to keep trying, right? But then there's going to be times when there's breaks or maybe after the session is over, which typically these sessions are multi-session when it's skills-based training anyway, right? I'm following up. Hey, what's going on? You know, are things okay? Is there a different thing that you need? I think just letting people know that you see them and that they matter makes a difference. You know, and I, and I do, every time I've ever done that or needed to do it, in the moment, especially when I was a younger trainer, a baby trainer, <laughs> I'm like, they hate me. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, as you grow and learn, and the more that I inquire with people, it's actually them. They're having a hard time. They got a call during the class and somebody got into an accident, you know, or some, who knows, right? And so just giving people a break and giving them, I used to work for Dale Carnegie, giving people the benefit of the doubt and having an option to communicate with you and letting them know that they have been and are being seen and you know they're doing their best, it works like magic. Does it work mm -hmm. for every single person all the time? No. But you know what? We're all responsible for ourselves. And I also believe that. And I stand tall in that I've given you lots of options and I've made myself available and uh, you know we're all doing our best. I stand tall that I've given you that. And if you decide not to take that, then that's okay too. That's where you are today. And I'm going to respect that from people too. And there's nothing that works on 100% of the people 100% of the time, even in live trainings with small groups. Right. I mean, you're going to get that. And I like what you said there. I, I try to tell the folks I work with that we need to move forward with an assumption of grace. That yeah. let's not assume malice. Let's not assume any negative things. Let's assume the best of intentions and, and figure out where we move from here. Yeah. Now I go back to up. your link. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, that used to come up when I managed a team of trainers at Carnegie. You know, sometimes clients would come back and say, we didn't get what we paid for. And a default might be to be like, I'm so, well, of course you say, I'm so sorry. Let me look into it. But, you know, you might just immediately be like, why didn't the trainer cover what they were told? <laughs> you know, and, you know, maybe you go back and watch the recording or check in and they did cover it. And that person got disconnected in that moment or whatever. And even when you go back to the client in that case, you say, oh, you know what? I know that it, it seemed like that part wasn't covered. And for you, it ended up not being covered. It's still going to do it with grace and mm -hmm. find an alternative for them and figure it out. You know, um, I love that grace. That's an that's a important point. How often are you engaging these folks to do something in the class? You, you see some who will go in and it's an hour long lecture. Uh, others who are putting sprinkling things in here in your mind what's what's the best average time to have somebody engaged in in this uh when on on average for me it seems like every three to five minutes we're doing something and i that's not that we're on a new topic or a new objective um but you know we're chatting we're changing screens i'm gonna I'm going to put people into a breakout room and you know, it, it, it varies from there. I wouldn't say every class that I deliver is something different every three to five minutes. I would say that to your point on average, I'm looking at 
three minutes is a long time to sit there doing nothing or doing the same thing. So can we switch it up in some kind of way? Now, sometimes, you know, you've been in a class and the conversation is like really good and it goes on for 10 minutes, you know, uh, even during that time, I might like stop screen sharing if I was on a visual or I might bring up a blank whiteboard and while the conversation's going, I'm like, everyone help me take notes. Let's keep this going. And it's maybe not planned, but we just do something a little bit different. And then I'm also really big on giving people breaks and uh, agency to, if they need to walk away, they need to walk away. You didn't have to wait for my break to tell you that, you know. Another thing right. to do on that note, Dwayne, um, regarding webcams, you know, like I don't force people to be staring at me in a webcam the whole time either. Um, I want people to be comfortable and, uh, you know, recognize that in today's day and age, where we are in 2024, if you're not on the camera, people aren't connecting with you in the same way as they are with those that are. But also just saying, listen, I don't want to stare at a camera all day either. And if you need a break, you take one. Yeah. Megan used to, to uh, say, we, we'd love to see your face. And it was that invitation. Hey, we're going to be talking to each other a lot. And I'd love to see your face while you're talking. And most people will turn their cameras on. Those who don't, you don't say, okay, you, I, I see your, it's just like, okay, you must have something going on. And that's cool. You know, yeah. we're all, we're all, it's that assumption of grace. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah. And so what we've talked about so far is making sure that the focus is on the participant, that it's not about you. And it's certainly not about the content. Uh, we see so many people, you talked a little bit about it there where it would, it almost seemed like the goal of this is for me to transmit this information and that's it. As long as the information gets transmitted, the, the training is a success and that's not accurate. It's, it's about them. It's about improving that performance. So making it about them, you know, and creating those opportunities for engagement, does that make someone a virtual training hero or is there more to it? <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know that uh, I, <laughs> I think there's so many versions of the hero, you know, to follow my own guidelines. I, I have, in fact, I have a new program that I launched this year where I'm looking at what does it mean to advance? And I think I'm going to answer the question with hero about the hero the same way. Um, advance means where are you and how do you move it? To, to plus, to more, to add on, whatever wording you want to use. So instead of me defining, well, that's advanced, I'm going to let an individual say, I have moved forward. And I think I'm going to take the same approach with the hero. You know, like, in what way do you define what you're doing and how do you do it? And is it working? Is it working for you? Is it working for the, uh, for the people attending? Are they doing the job? Is the organization happy? The department's happy? <laughs> All those things. So looking around at the assessments and, uh, whether or not that's happening. I mean, certainly my Fantastic. programming all has formalities around what a hero is because the world asked me to, but I gave you just more of a creative answer there. <laughs> no, and it's very James Clear, Atomic Habits, you know, getting that 1% better every day, advancing forward. So you've got, I'm looking, you see two books. I, I remember when I was there, I looked at your books and I'm like, I'm, I know I own this. I know I own this. <laughs> yeah. And I got back to my library and I'm like, where is it? And then it dawned on me, I bought it. And then I gave it to a friend who was actually leading virtual trainings. I'm like, here, you should read this. This is great. Nice. And that's why I don't have any more. So I need to buy another copy. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, it's Cassie, Cassie Labori Consulting LLC. You're on LinkedIn. Where else can we find you? Where are you most active? I am most active on LinkedIn. And I also have a community that I would love to extend an invitation to anyone listening. If you want to nerd out on all things virtual training and uh, remote work. We hang out once a month on the last Friday of the month. It's called the uh, Hero Hangout, the Virtual Training Hero Hangout. And you can find it at CassieConsulting.com. That's just, uh, I don't know, somehow people freely hang out with me once a month for 45 <laughs> minutes. And <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, That's awesome. I, 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 we have a great time and a lot of networking happens there as well as a lot of learning uh, features, strategies, approaches. Uh, just community building, all sorts of things. And uh, so that's where I'm at a whole lot. 
Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. We're, we're, we're at time, and I just want to say again, thanks for what you do. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me. I appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next event we're both at. Thank you so much for having me today, Duane. It was wonderful.